person. So uh, we've seen how God will take notice of the cries of uh, the oppressed. And in this case, the oppressed are the workers okay? from James chapter 5 and verse 5 or the, um, the uh, ill-treated workers. Uh, so, you know, so far that's what you've seen. Now, coming to verse 6, or, or we'll start with verse 5. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. So, basically, the... Uh, James is saying that the rich person is living a very comfortable life. The rich person is not uh, shaken in any way, uh, even though they have exploited. You know, the unrighteous rich person has exploited uh, these workers. The worker is not able to do anything against you know, such a rich and influential person. So uh, he's reminding them that this is not, you know, your stability and security. It's not permanent. It seems like nobody can touch, you know, a very wealthy uh, person. But that's not the case. When we engage in, you know, unrighteous actions, uh, definitely God takes notice of it. The people who have, have been oppressed by it. You know, their cries, um, are uh, they reach the ears of God. So we must walk with fear and trembling before the Lord. So now let's move forward to the next section here. Now, you, now the, the audience is going to change. Okay, so that is something different uh, about the way James is writing. You know, it's like all these bits and pieces that he has finally sewn it all together. So till now, he was telling the rich, uh, repent, fear God. He's going to judge you. The riches are going to be destroyed. You know, nothing is permanent, all that. Now, from verse 7, he's talking to the oppressed. Okay, he's talking to the workers who have been ill-treated. And what does he tell them? Let's read, you know, some verses. He says, therefore, why, wherefore, that God is going to judge. Okay. He is a God of justice, ultimately. So, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no no, lest you fall into judgment. So now he's telling the, uh, if you want to say, you know, the workers or the poorer people in the uh, congregation or the believers. So he's telling them what can happen when they are oppressed? You know, what kind of response or reaction can they, they have? They can um, just become impatient. Okay, and, and say, God, why are you doing this? Why is there nothing good happening to us? All these rich people are living so comfortably. Why can't you, um, you know, see our pain? So or they could react in that kind of a way and you know, say that, okay, fine. God is not going to do anything about my situation. Forget about my faith. Forget about trusting in God. I'll go my own way. So, to... Prevent that. 
he is reminding the oppressed poor worker believer is telling them be patient my brethren until the coming of the lord so how much patience is needed lots of patience is needed till the coming of the lord he's saying ultimately you know have you read the last uh, chapter of the book like today we are doing the last chapter of our course you will in the last chapter of the book you will see the uh, conclusion you know who wins the battle uh, who uh, you know conquers it's in the end so you need to hold on ultimately god you know will come through for you so don't be impatient and remain patient until the coming of the lord so he gives an example of patience he says okay look at the farmer i am sure all of us know you know what farmers do you put the seed and some crops are quick you know in matter of weeks or uh, a few months you get it i think some other crops will take several months now does any farmer put a seed and on the third day say i'm a failure nothing is growing okay i am giving up farming you know i'll do something else i'll go and do poultry no farmer will do that because any logical sane farmer knows that the seed will take time to grow so then what does he do he understands about the seed the timing of things and he does what he needs to do so then he prepares the soil you know he will add more manure or you know put more nutrition for the crops he'll figure out the uh you know the uh, irrigation so many things pest control he is working on everything so that according to its timing the crop will grow there will be something like the you know it will be the harvest time at the harvest time the crop will be ready your grains will be ready or the fruit will be ready that is the perfect time to um, you know get it off and get it ready to either you want to sell it or use it yourself so a farmer is not impatient he knows the kind of time it is going to take for the entire process so he says look at the farmer he is so patient about the precious fruit of the earth or the harvest he is waiting for the harvest waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain so early and latter rain is uh, in their times there was um, uh, an early rain which will prepare the ground for sowing okay and after that the farmers would sow and just before harvest there will be another rain which will sort of prepare the crops for harvest so that's why they had in their calculation they had two rains the early rain and the latter rain so when the latter rain comes they know this is the time for the harvest so he says look the farmer has an understanding about timing and so he exercises patience even we have to do the same be patient god will bring justice to this matter in verse 8 he says you also be patient establish your hearts for the coming of the lord is at hand you see again he talks about the coming of the lord but he says it is at hand or to say that you know how we uh, um, say about the return of jesus we say jesus is coming back soon behold i am coming soon that's what jesus said so he is reminding them it's not going to be all that long uh, actually so uh, please for some more time be patient and trust that god will do what is righteous for you now one is people could become impatient okay there are a couple of other things that can happen when people are oppressed so we will look at that now one side note uh, we've seen early rain latter rain uh, mentioned here for us spiritually okay, for us spiritually uh, the rain is a picture or it's a symbol of the outpouring of the holy spirit so the 
outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it was Holy Spirit was already poured out, you know, on the day of Pentecost, the birth of the church. That is like the early rain. But we're also trusting God for, you know, something, um, a, a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the end times in the end times or closer to the return of the Lord Jesus. And when this happens, uh, we're calling it the latter rain, okay? the latter rain. And we know that when the rain falls, there will be a harvest. So when the Holy Spirit falls upon the people and you know, globally uh, on the body of Christ, uh, we can expect many souls to be one for the kingdom of God. It's just a side note. James is not referring to any of this, but just for us to kind of connect this and see oh uh, early rain uh, latter rain and you know we will we will see a harvest because connected to the latter rain is the harvest okay so now let's uh, continue i told us there can be some other responses when we are oppressed what are those responses he's he says do not grumble against one another brethren lest you be condemned behold the judge is standing at the door so here is another response that we can begin to grumble against our oppressors okay and grumbling is um to say that oh look at them and talk ill of them and not just that why are we doing this because we don't have faith in god that god will give us a recompense for what we have been through so in a way, when we grumble, it's not simply against the, our oppressors alone, but we are also in doubt if there will be any justice. So he's saying, you know, try to avoid this. Grumbling is not good. Instead, what is better? Address the matter. If there is something in our capacity or power to um deal with the situation you deal with it that would be better okay otherwise what happens we start grumbling then we start you know grumbling about it to everybody whether we like it or not it's become gossip now you know, tell, telling everyone oh you know these people they are like this this is how they are uh, they don't pace enough this and so i'm talking about what i'm going through without actually addressing the matter and i've become you know a a person who's grumbling and complaining and uh, James reminds the people that lest you be condemned what is condemned do you remember the Israelites who are being led by Moses they were grumblers they just grumbled and grumbled about hey we don't have what we used to have in Egypt you know the leeks and the garlic I don't know what and all uh, ingredients that they were missing out in their cooking so they were grumbling about that we don't have meat uh moses only you brought us so god got so angry that we see there were people who died in the wilderness because of this grumbling attitude god does not like grumbling so that's why he says lest you be condemned we have already seen that grumblers receive you know a uh, judgment from God. So please don't get into that category. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So he's saying, you know, God will do the right thing. So um, don't grumble. Then, verse 10, he says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. You know, the prophets of, uh, you could say, the Old Testament, because those were the prophets that uh, the early church leaders like James, they knew about. And they knew that the prophets also had been through so many difficulties. You, know, you had Elijah, Elisha, you had people like Jeremiah, whose message was, you know, he was known as the weeping prophet. People were not ready to accept him because of the kind of message which he carried. So they also went through so many sufferings. But he says that they were patient. They continued to do God's work because they were trusting God, that God is going to reward them. God is going to protect them. So you carry the same attitude. Then in verse 11, he points to a specific person, that is Job. So he says, indeed, we count them blessed 
who endure, you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. That the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So he reminds them, patience is not useless. So patience, not just uh, you know, waiting. It's not only waiting. It is waiting depending on God. Okay, Waiting, trusting God. And that is the example of the prophets and Job. So what is the story of, of Job? What is the example of Job? Even Job, initially, you know, so many things happened to him. Uh, evil things happened to him. <laughs> but towards the end, we know that God restored double to Job. So that's what he's saying. The nature of God is such that he is very merciful and very compassionate. So be patient. Even if uh, you've had losses, your end will be like Job's end. Where you will be blessed. You will be doubly blessed. Now, one more thing. Intended by the Lord. You know, the sufferings of Job intended by the Lord, it says. So some people take this to explain that God made Job suffer. Why did God make Job suffer? So that he can bless Job double. Now, we are very, very clear that God cannot give what he does not have. Isn't it? So God does not put suffering on us or he does not put sickness on us. He doesn't bring evil upon our lives. Why do we go through so many difficulties? Because we live in a sin-corrupted world. The world is corrupted by sin. And we sometimes, you know, face the consequences for action. So when something is done, there is a result for that consequence. So even because of that, right? And you have a very active enemy, the devil who is ready to attack us. Now, whenever I face any difficulty in my life, I should never think, oh, God is doing this to me. God is making me sick. God is giving me a lot of troubles so that I can become a better person. No, that is wrong. Okay? So never take this verse, you know, to interpret and say, Job's difficulties were intended by God. God permitted it, God allowed it. You know, see, when people say that, the meaning is God wanted Job to suffer. See, however, uh, the way we would see this is Job suffered. Why did Job suffer? Why do we have struggles in our lives? Why do we face so many difficulties in our lives? There are many reasons. But what is not a reason is God is making us suffer. That is not the reason at all. It can never be the reason. Okay. Um, as I told us, you know, again, I'll just go over it. We're already living in a world which is corrupted by sin. Okay. So um, that is one reason. Then uh, actions have consequences. They could be our actions or other people's actions. Because of that, you know, suffering comes into our lives. And in the journey of life, you see, there are trials. As you're growing, there will be trials. There will be challenges. You know, there, uh, and for especially for those of us who are believers, we have seen that persecution. Persecution is a very, very real thing. Okay, there will be persecution. Now, we cannot ask God, you know, God, why? If you're in the world, you will have tribulation. Jesus said that. But one thing very clear, God does not intend to make anybody suffer. We have to be very clear on that. And especially because, you know, you, you've all come through Bible college for, after so many courses. If any of us say that, you know, God is putting sickness on people, or God is making people suffer, it would be alarming that, oh, we didn't understand till now that God is not the one who is wanting us to suffer. 
he did the opposite he wanted to get us out of all this suffering that is why he sent jesus to be our redeemer okay so that's a little bit about job but ultimately what james is saying is he sa he says look at job's life he was patient but at the end of it all he was blessed with double so your patience is helpful you too will receive a good reward now verse 12 he says but above all my brethren do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath but let your yes be yes and your no no lest you fall into judgment now during the times of james they had this practice of swearing okay they will swear and um, it was uh, considered uh, uh, okay to do that and while swearing they would say uh, i swear by the heaven or i swear by the earth or they had a way of swearing and in that method of swearing um, they would excuse themselves okay I, i'll just give an example so uh, ultimately people would when they swear they need to do it okay so that's the whole point i swear by something what are they saying they're saying this will definitely be done or this is how it is definitely but they had come up with a method of swearing where it was okay to not keep the word so hey i didn't swear by uh, such and such but i sw i swore by something else so it's okay you know if you swear by that it's fine you don't have to keep your word so they had created this whole uh, different standards of swearing also that if you swore by certain things then it's okay if you don't keep your word so james was addressing that and he said what double standards this is hypocrisy P you people don't even keep your word why do you even want to swear why you, why do you want to make it complicated don't swear just let your yes be yes let your no be no let your word be worth everything okay so he <laughs> he's just uh, helping the oppressed have the right attitude he's telling them be patient don't grumble uh, you know don't uh, swear right don't swear don't do things like this but trust look at the example of the prophets look at the example of job you know they they were uh, they held on and god came through for them you too will be doubly blessed uh, like job so don't worry you know, don't worry god is there god is watching everything and he will bring you out now let's move forward so coming to the next section here yeah so we are at verse uh, 13 verse 13 he tells them some more what more to do now obviously the people who are oppressed are suffering so he tells them is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing, sing psalms so he is giving them instructions on how they can express what they are going through so if if i am uh, uh, suffering or even respond you know, uh, in what i am going through so he says in the beginning he said don't do this don't do that you know don't uh, grumble don't swear now he tells them <laughs> excuse me you pray if you are suffering that's the best thing to do you go before god you pray and if you're feeling cheerful then you sing a song you sing hymns unto the lord so he begins to tell them what to do okay in this particular passage this moment yeah all right so yeah another good thing to do when uh, you know going through suffering is one was uh, be patient 
also pray. Verse 14, he says, Is anyone among you sick? What to do if somebody is sick? So here is James' advice. He says, Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So do you notice that till now it was more about oppressor, oppressed, but now little bit it is changing because he's saying anybody is happy, you sing psalms. Anybody is sick, you know, you, you call the elders of the church. So audience, you could say, is now kind of becoming general, okay, or by this point. So he says, if you're cheerful, then you sing hymns. If anyone is sick, we call the elders of the church. Why elders? Because uh, the understanding of an elder is somebody who is more spiritually mature in the in the congregation. So the implication is they will be they will have faith. They will have more faith to pray a prayer of faith over the sick person. So that's why he says, call the elders of the church and let them pray a prayer a prayer over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay, so. One of the ways, uh, I am sure all of you have completed the course on healing and deliverance. And in that course, we have seen that there are many different ways to minister healing to the sick. This is just one of the ways to anoint somebody with oil. Uh, and you see, the authority here is in the name of Jesus, name of the Lord. So he says, use this. Use this as a you know a method. So it doesn't mean that every time this has to be done, you have to put oil and uh, you know call the elders of the church. Not necessarily. Anybody who has faith can minister and uh, minister in any way. But this is what James recommends: call the elders of the church, anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. Then he says the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. So he expects that the elders will pray a prayer with faith. Okay. So the prayer of faith will save the sick. That's very encouraging. We are told that whenever we minister to the sick, let us minister with faith. Let us minister, you know, anointing with oil is for the presence of the Holy Spirit that represents the presence of the Holy Spirit or the power of the Holy Spirit and with the authority in the name of Jesus. You see, so powerful, isn't it? Faith, presence of the Holy Spirit, authority of the name of Jesus. So when such a prayer is made, he says, it will save the sick. Amazing. So he says, be confident when you pray in faith in this manner, if there's anyone sick, he's, and he's also speaking very confidently, he says, it will save the sick and the Lord will, see, he says, will save, will raise. So we can have confidence in this, that God will heal the sick among us. But, you know, we need to pray. We need to pray. And he also adds, he says, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So sometimes there is also um, uh, associated sin that needs to be dealt with. But, you know, God is gracious. Not only will healing come, but also forgiveness will come. Now, 16, he says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So notice that sometimes, sometimes, not always, you know, every, uh, every trespass need not be confessed with one another. But sometimes it is good to share or confess our trespasses with one another. Uh, and it brings, you know, it, it brings uh, a release of God's, God's forgiveness uh, upon our lives. So. Uh, he says, it's good to do. And, you know, in some situations, uh, maybe the person that you're confessing to is the person that we have, we have wronged them. So confession always helps because you're, we are humbling ourselves before that person and saying, hey, I'm so sorry. I did this. I should not have done this. It has affected you. But when we do that, we are told healing will come. 
you know we are doing the right thing and uh, uh, that's the way you know confession it helps many uh, but we have to know you know which are the situations so to make this as a uh, one rule for all will not work to say that oh every sin has to be confessed then only you will be forgiven because we don't see that elsewhere in the bible now we have jesus christ who is already our, our mediator directly uh, and we can come boldly into god's presence if we confess our sins to him he will forgive us so why should i go to another human being for everything and confess it's not necessary but in some situations it's okay and even needed to confess our sins to one another and uh, again you know maybe somebody mature somebody who's mature in god um, and the right person to speak to it will be helpful you know if, the, if there are uh, certain sins that a believer is engaged in which they are not able to come out of they can go to such a mature believer and confess and pray and they will find healing okay now one thing that we should never <laughs> interpret this as is when we confess to people forgiveness will come and healing will come is it because it's coming through the people not at all where is our forgiveness coming from our forgiveness is coming from the finished work of the cross okay so that's where we are receiving our forgiveness from god people have nothing to do with the release of our forgiveness but it's an act of faith to confess to somebody and uh, that will bring a release of uh, healing to us okay so uh, that's what james is talking about now he adds over here he says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much so he says that you know so far he said pray pray if you're suffering you pray if you're sick you pray now what kind of prayer should one pray he says the effective fervent prayer okay by which he simply means that it's a sort of a committed focused prayer a persistent prayer which we don't disengage from we continue to see god we are sincerely you know going after him and he says when you pray like that there will be power from our prayer and he says the prayer of a righteous man so another thing another important thing for effective prayer or you know a uh, prayer that brings results righteous life is also important because god's ears are open to the prayers of the righteous so we can't do you know whatever we like live however we like and then expect every prayer to get answered uh, god will not be pleased with that and he doesn't even answer you know uh prayers if we live like that but righteous life and uh fervent prayer sincere prayer persistent prayer committed prayer when we go after god in this way we will see the results and now you know, there is an example of a, a person who prayed that is elijah so in verse 17 18 i'll read both the verses he says elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for 3 years and 6 months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit so you know he is telling do you see the power in prayer how you know the the uh, effective fervent prayer of a righteous man creates power it generates power okay like elijah he prayed what did he pray first he prayed that it should not rain and then he prayed that it should rain okay and we also observe that when he prayed he was also engaging in persistent prayer remember uh, he already had a word from god that it is going to rain but he had to pray seven times for the slightest evidence that it was going to rain but did he give up he never gave up okay so, but there was a result when he stuck to it and he saw god do what god had spoken from his word 
through his word so in that manner he's encouraging the believers see we're going through hard times difficult times but look at all these people they also went through uh, challenging times they also waited for the fulfillment of god's promise over their lives but they prayed elijah prayed it took time but he prayed he never gave up never gave up he kept telling you know his his uh, servant there go see go see seven times he prayed finally you know, there was a result for his prayer so he's saying it will work but you don't give up there is going to be a result for the prayers okay be patient and continue in prayer now coming here to the next set of verses yeah verse 19 he says uh okay i'll just read before i go to the next verse here uh james 5 16 the last part there the amplified bible i'll just read that version of the you know the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much so it it is like this in the amplified it says the earnest or heartfelt continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available dynamic in its working so you see same thing it says that when we don't give up sincere prayer continuous prayer will yield dynamic results okay now coming to verse 19 it says brethren if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So now with that, James sort of ends this book. So he says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, so he's talking about believers. So is it possible for believers to go away from the faith, to go away from the truth? Yes there is a possibility and you know it's a sobering thought that uh, something like this could happen that you know one who is following christ can go away from that so he says uh, if at all you know somebody goes away then uh, we need to bring them back okay so, and one who does that one who brings them back saves a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins or you know, that is uh, bringing them back into the redemption that christ jesus has already bought for that person now we expect you know we saw so far hebrews uh, you had the concluding passages there where you know it was about uh, be hospitable this and that and again uh, first peter second peter we saw you know, there were all these passages about you know uh, honor one another uh, honor the king and so many things but in the book of james there's no conclusion very abrupt isn't it he just says uh, the believer might wander and anyone who brings him back helps that person and then book is over so we don't know why you know such an abrupt ending um james has but somehow you know since it's the early book i don't know whether he intended to write more but he did not so various reasons for why it has stopped like this suddenly but good thing about james is uh he is dealing with the reality of uh, um, you know believers lifestyle around him he doesn't let them go and, and say yeah do whatever you want no he has noticed different issues and uh, he takes them head on and we've no we've noticed that isn't it uh, section after section he's saying do this don't do this okay you rich people you you oppressed workers you know you you uh, who are suffering you who are sick so he is addressing different sections of the, the congregation, their uh, problems, their challenges, and you know, uh, encouraging them, bringing instruction. And that's the way in which you know, he uh, actually guides the believers. So with this verse, you know, we come to the end of our um, uh, book of James and also the entire 
course for the semester and uh, you all must have noticed your um, um, your assignments are up and uh, i think another two or three days for you all to submit it and this time i made the assignments easy even for the google classroom students so i really expect all of you to score well uh, in in the assignments uh, only the last assignment has a little bit of writing to do uh, but i believe i have given you enough sufficient time because uh, i have not put any questions from james you already have the understanding from you know first peter second peter and jude so uh, that's all i i expect from you so you should be doing well in your assessments so all the best uh, everybody and uh, especially the batch that is completing 3 years uh, excellent you know good work Thank you for journeying so long. You know, it's an inspiration. And I really hope to uh, not just um, uh, rejoice with you in your graduation, but also going ahead, going forward. Uh, I really look forward to God doing mighty things through each one of your lives and through your ministries. Okay, so blessings. Uh, um, uh, may may uh, you know the Lord strengthen you and work powerfully through each one of you. Okay, let's just close with a word of prayer. Uh, any any thoughts, questions before we close? This is the last of the last <laughs> classes. Like, you know, you have the last bands of the wedding. So this is it, closed. Yeah, anyone? Anything to say? Okay, all here in the chat. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so things are clear. Happy to know that. Okay, nice, nice. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. for... Uh... Can you hear me, yeah. ma'am? I can hear you. I can hear you, Thomas. Thank you so much for teaching us. It's really a blessing to learn the yeah. subjects. Yeah, thank <laughs> you, subjects, Thomas. Uh, yeah. The last chapter was really awesome. Mm -hmm. Learn the present. Yeah, great for the mm -hmm. Yes. We'll yes. meet the uh, graduation. We are thankful to you, all teachers. We are happy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> blessed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Really look forward to connecting with uh, all of you. It's been so long, no? We've not uh, met. Almost two years, I guess. Two years. More than two. Pandemic. Two. More than two, right? Yeah, more than two. Easily more than two years. Yeah. So we should meet. Yeah, just pray that uh, all this truth, don't don't settle with this. As I've been saying, keep going back to these books. God will help you understand uh, in a deeper way. Okay, so let's uh, close then with a word of prayer. I'll pray for all of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, which cleanses us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the presence of the Holy Spirit that, Lord, uh, you are bringing um, uh, the understanding, Lord, to each one of our hearts. Lord, we pray that you will enable us to use it in our walk with you, Lord, that you will enable us, Lord Jesus, to, um, uh, Lord, be the right representatives uh, Lord, of, of your kingdom and of your son to the world around us. And Lord, I pray for each student. Father God, I pray your blessing upon them. Lord, I pray for your anointing uh, in their lives, Father God, to do the work that you've called them to do. I pray that, Lord, you will uh, empower them, Lord, not just to complete the course, but Lord, uh, be clear about their vision, Father, so that, Lord, the next steps which they take, that they, it will be aligned Lord, to the call that you have for their lives. And Lord, I pray, grant them favor, grant them open doors, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray that they will be able to step out 
uh, Lord, and uh, share the gospel. They'll be able to disciple many people, Lord, for for the kingdom. And Lord, let signs, wonders, and miracles follow them, Lord, in the work of the ministry. And Father God, we we pray that you will be greatly glorified, Lord, through each and every effort, Lord, of of your children. Lord, thank you once again, Lord. Thank you for uh, all the students, Father God, and Lord, thank you for their families, oh God, who have stood with them through these three years lord jesus and lord i pray that you'll continue to bless them abundantly provide their every need father and uh, uh, lord we 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 pray lord we pray that you will uh, establish them so that they will be grounded and rooted in the word of god father and that they will be um, lord uh, uh, supplied with abundance and ready for every good work that you want to release through their lives, Father God. Thank you once again, Lord, because, Lord, you hear our prayers, Lord, and you do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So thank you, class. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I'll see your assignments, your answers, and also I'll see you at the graduation. God bless. Thank, Thank you, man. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.